Thank you, Jody. And it is so wonderful to have such a great group assembled for this panel on global markets and institutions. So our goal here is to understand the current global market landscape in general and the relation between and the interaction between the Chinese market and the global institutions specifically. Uh, we hope to think big. We hope to learn about the big pictures from the uh, on the ground day to day experiences of our esteemed panelists. So uh, we will organize the questions loosely in three categories. The first will start looking at the general global landscape, and uh, next we'll start looking into the two way exchanges of international capital flows, both uh, Chinese capital flows outside to the overseas, as well as the uh, international capital flow into China. And then last, we'll look into some specific Chinese uh, policy issues. So, without further ado, uh, I'll start with the first question. Uh, for each question, I'll direct the question to one of you. Uh, feel free to chime in uh, to share your thoughts. Okay. So, first on global markets. In the uh, past decade or so, uh, the BRICS countries, Brazil, India, China, Russia, and South Africa, have been in the center of emerging markets. Now, the discussion about the next 10 was the MIN countries, that is, Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. So, the question to you is, have we moved on from the group countries, and if so, what emerging economies excite you the most? I'll start with uh, Johnson. What would you like to do? I've always actually had a big problem with. Uh, BRIC countries, BRICS countries, because I, I when I look at those, uh, look at the that acronym, look at countries, look at Brazil, look at uh, Russia, look at China, uh, India, and South Africa. I don't think they have a lot in common, and uh, so it's uh, kind of interesting uh, when when people try to kind of bring them together. It was all only because these are all emerging countries, and they all seem to be growing at a reasonably fast uh, pace, and that was it. That was the reason. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, there are uh, interrelations between some of these countries. You know, China buys resources from Brazil, uh, but I would say, you know, the interconnectedness between the Chinese economy and the European economy and the U.S. economy is a lot closer, and therefore, you know, it's uh, uh, that, that's uh, you know, that's uh, it's it's not particularly, in, in my mind, particularly meaningful to talk about uh, to talk about BRICS. Um, I think today, you know, the, to me, the interesting thing uh, that, that, that actually, uh, Professor Chen, that you, that you mentioned, I, I find interesting is, I, my, in my own view, uh, globalization has probably gotten as far as it can go. Um, I think globalization, uh, as we saw it over the last 20 years, happened primarily because of China. Uh, you have a very large uh, workforce that came into the global marketplace because previously China was totally isolated. So that large, inexpensive labor force came into the global marketplace. Then at the same time, the Chinese government invested very, very heavily in infrastructure that really connected China to the, to, to, to the global marketplace. And therefore, that labor force could be very effectively used uh, in, in, in the global marketplace. And I think on top of that, uh, at least during the early phase of that period, energy prices were reasonably, reasonably low. So transportation products, and you, know, you have Brazilian iron ore being transported into China, and then Chinese products being then shipped globally. So that was actually economically a viable proposition. I think a lot of these things have changed. The Chinese labor force has peaked. Um, I think going forward, uh, I think we are going to see a decline in terms of the absolute number of people uh, that, that will come into, into, into the labor force. I think energy prices have become very, very high. Uh, and therefore, that makes some of these kind of Global flow of commodities and products less attractive economically. I think protectionism um, has to come up, has to rise. 
Um, so I think all of these things create frictions that prevents globalization from, um, from going further. I think going forward, we're going to see more regionalized economies. And in this kind of more regionalized economies, a number of the countries that you mentioned actually will have very important roles to play. I always feel if Mexico can get its own domestic things in order, Mexico will be a very, very formidable manufacturing uh, center uh, for North America and potentially uh, worldwide. I think some of the other emerging countries that you talk about, Indonesia, for example, you know, have a very interesting and attra attractive domestic market. Um, you know, the, to me, the issue there is probably need to figure out a way to get capital flows uh, to go the right way in order for Indonesia to be an attractive, uh, an attractive market. You know, we are a global firm, so we do invest globally. Uh, you know, we have been investing in Latin America. We have been investing in, 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 in South Africa. But I would say, you know, today, uh, we still find China to be uh, a very attractive place uh, to, to make investments. Thank you, Jonathan. You actually touched on many topics we all will hopefully have a chance to dive in later on. But oh, before we move on, sorry, I want to uh, hear, I guess, uh, Papun, Papun, what's your thought on the global landscape <coughs> changing? And what, what, what are the exciting areas and places for you? Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to repeat anything that Jonathan said. I think roughly I agree with um, most of the things he said there. But, uh, essentially, I think break. <laughs> Um, I mean, it was, it is still this, and you know, a significant economic engine is a block. Uh, times are different, and if you want to just kind of throw in a little bit of common threads, uh, I suppose at that point, uh, China, and still at this point, China and India were the demanders of uh, the various commodities, and the other two, Russia and Brazil, were the suppliers. Um, and during the times when we had a commodity super cycle, we had it because of the global demand. Um, uh, those were a very significant block. Uh, I don't think the demographics has changed. I don't think they certainly haven't moved anywhere. Uh, still the same number of people. Um, and the resources are still there. Uh, I, I think we're just going through a certain business cycle um, whereby growth is not as behaving as in an exciting way as it had behaved earlier when we had the commodity super cycle. Um, so it's just different, and I think it will come back in its own way. It's also idiosyncratic uh, in, in, in each market. They have their own challenges. But I think if you were to ask from a global perspective, I, and I'm trying to put it into a context of, I suppose, three key areas, not particularly pressing on any country. Um, I would say if you were to look at the United States and Europe and say Asia um, or emerging markets, um, probably you can kind of put it into different phases of the business cycle where the US today is in an acceleration stage where we're getting an economy that's growing at about maybe two, two and a half percent, depending on who you ask. And in Europe, you're probably getting somewhere at half of what the United States is getting. Uh, and in Asia, a little bit more exciting, driven by China at about 7.5%, and in India at maybe 55 to 6%. Um, and in the aggregate, in Asia, uh, clocking possibly 5.5% to 6% growth. So those are the sort of key uh, returns. Um, the United States being acceleration, Europe being more accommodation, and I think in Asia, stabilization or rebalancing. Um, we all have our own different issues uh, in different countries. Um, China, particularly, um, being in the past a low cost producer, uh, manufacturer to the world, has to reinvent um, itself a little bit today. I think it has to be a little bit more focused on the um, standardization uh, and as well I think speaking from many many countries in Asia um, we probably need to follow a little bit in terms of what Japan has done particularly well 
uh, post World War II, which is to just focus on product quality, and in itself is built a very strong brand equity. So they have a lot of brands. Brands are very important because it provides customer stickiness, it provides customer loyalty, and as uh, your manufacturing base is, starts to get expensive, you move to countries, but you still have the shelves, you still own the brands. You simply move to your manufacturing base. Um, and you see that uh, Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan have also done that very well. You can kind of see they have numerous number of brands, global brands, that is not, not domestic brands. If you, if you look at countries, um, you probably see they have very strong brands, but they are mostly domestic brands. Um, you know, they dominate in their own markets, but um, not enough Asian companies uh, they don't, don't really have enough um, brands and they haven't been in a culture of building those global brands. Um, and I suppose, you know, in the past um, 10, 10 plus years or so, I've been a little bit of an evangelist in trying to convince uh, companies um, because my line of work is mergers and acquisitions uh, in trying to convince companies that they should be thinking about brand acquisitions or building global brands. And I, I think it's probably easier to acquire than to build them uh, for, for, for most cases. And you're seeing a lot of those type of trends that's going on uh, in, in, in global markets. Thank you, Dr. Calvin asked you a question to you, which is a kind of a segue from the general uh, question, but uh, it's also related to uh, something that uh, both Jonathan and Parapu mentioned, the training of commodity natural resources, uh, both uh, around the world as well as the modern and world countries, especially China, fighting uh, natural resources and commodity <coughs> Brazil, Russia, and other countries. And you affirm White and Case uh, is at the center of the action in this area. Uh, you had, uh, uh, had the, the two major China Europe, uh, development bank loan facilities in the last couple of years. And just a few days ago, the Chinese consortium acquisition of the Peruvian copper mine. Just uh, to look on the uh, vintage point of the microtransaction here, uh, what can we learn about the global economy from this deal in general? And uh, what does the world need to know about the, I guess, the, the general Chinese uh, capital uh, outflow uh, in general, as well as China specifically? Well, thank you, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, let me go back to the BRICS uh, conference. Well, I actually have worked on the BRICS initiative myself uh, as the only lawyer. Uh, let me just get the first thing first. Uh, when Tim O'Neill coined the term, it was a BRIC. B-R-I-C. Then they added South Africa. Then it became BRICS. And in 2012, uh, I was asked to draft two documents. And the purpose of the two documents was trying to link the five or to unite the five countries together. They could do something together. We first met in Sanya in Highland Province. Then we met in Sochi, uh, Kochi, rather, not Sochi, Kochi in India which is the southern tip of India. And there were two documents I was asked to draft, and I was meeting with five countries, uh, the senator representatives, the two documents. And one was the free work agreement, uh, upon which they would encourage one another to trade and use their own currencies as the currency of settlement, as a way to reduce their individual dependency on the US dollar. That was the first condition. Second was a document which basically encouraged each country's banks to issue letters of credit to one another, again, using their own currencies. And then with President Hu Jintao and all the top leaders, they went to New Delhi a few weeks later to sign the document. That was, in fact, the last time the five countries sat together. Nothing has happened ever since. My view actually echo uh, Jonathan's uh, assessment. My view, having had the experience, it's very hard for five, 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 five countries to come together. Not only because there are differences in economy, in culture, and the political system, but it was clear to me there was no clear leader among five countries. Not only that, 
Noah was willing to be the leader without sacrifice. So, in a real five hundred, we have five hundred sitting together. They are all very strong. No one is willing to be the leader. You cannot have a group. And we heard about leadership discussion this morning, and it was clear to me that was was missing. And I think, and then I think China quickly realized the great concept probably will take a long time to come to fruition. But China, as you may have heard, had moved to Pan Asia. Concept. That's why China is not leading the effort to form Asia <coughs> infrastructure back. And then it's, it's, it will be a competitor to Asia development by the world back. Bank. But I think that the concept is narrow. Back to the question about resources. Uh, I've worked on two major transactions which have some impact on how uh, China is, uh, is linked to the rest of the world and how others look at China. And I think I'll come back to comment on the perception of Chinese investment in those countries. One was in 2010 and 11, I worked on the transaction, which is a $20 billion loan to Venezuela. In fact, the loan was uh, consisted of 10 billion US, 70 billion RMB. And the loan repayment was tied to the oil resources of that country. And when the Chinese leader and also the Chinese bank asked me, Mr. Lee, what, as a lawyer, what do you see as the biggest risk? And I think the payment is not a problem because as long as they have oil, they can pay you. And I think on the, on the China part, it's not a problem because the Chinese consumer is now, now becoming the biggest consumer of oil. That's not a problem. The payment is not a problem. The problem really is we will lend twenty billion dollars to anyone. How the money is deployed and how quickly the money is deployed. That's the problem. I said for example, let's say tomorrow, at the time Hugo Chavez was still alive. In fact, I was negotiating with his cousin, Ashtubo Chavez. And I said, assume the Chavez is no longer in power, they have a new leader. Do you think the new leader is willing to repay Chinese debt? If I were the new leader, I would challenge. I said, look, the $20 billion, at least part of it, was not used to benefit the well-being of the entire country's people. Why should I, as the new leader, continue to use the, the country's resources to, to repay China? Particularly if they found evidence the Chinese authorities knew that part of the money was not being used, but employed, but used to benefit the entire country's people's well being. I think leaders, you have to pay attention to this. It sounds large, it sounds big, but you have to focus on this. Similarly, in the, in the same situation, in the, uh, in, the, in the reported, I think a few weeks ago, that China was going to buy Las Bambas. A huge copper mine in uh, Peugeot. We advise the buyer, we advise the buyer not only to purchase but also to borrow money to, uh, to lend. This is my question. I've done a lot of similar transactions, but I think that the fundamental question people always ask me, Mr. Lee, what's the biggest risk? I said, look, I said, you have to ask yourself. This is, I think, ties into Jesse Wu's comment that I think today is valuable. And I said, to, I said to Chinese leader, no Chinese SOEs, and I said, look, ask yourself, apart from money, what can and should we bring to other countries' people? Apart from money. They know the Chinese have money. They know the Chinese work hard. They know they can you know, send people to work there. But apart from work, work, and money, and money, what else can they bring to them? I, uh, my, uh, sadly, uh, it's sad to say, uh, most people have not even thought about this. In fact, uh, six months ago, I was involved in drafting a document, a, a paper, for the Chinese party school. That, in fact, was the concept. And the good thing is, people start to pay attention to what else they should and can bring to other countries.
that would be great. Thank you. Actually, that is a perfect uh, segue to my next question, which is the use of, uh, I guess, the Chinese money to buy natural resources overseas. Uh, our direct discussion to Jonathan, as an investor, uh, you direct money to the highest return. Uh, apparently, but obviously, the Chinese acquisition of natural resources would only benefit the Chinese economy. In your view, is that the highest return investment? What are the opportunity costs of the Chinese government investing the money in providing resources from other countries? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a complicated question, and I think uh, difficult. Uh, we need to come with a, uh, a, a sort of a, a uniform answer. I think that it really depends. Uh, you know, I've seen situations where I think the investments were thoughtful. Uh, were clearly you know, well uh, evaluated. Uh, the contracts were uh, you know, well drafted. Uh, but, but I think when you, when you think about overseas investment, I think actually, you know, wait, I, I still, I, I try to work with people uh, in international overseas investment projects as well. And I think there are actually a number of things that I believe actually people need to really, really focus on and, and think about. One is obviously, uh, you know, just again, when you make any investment, when you're thinking about returns, you're thinking about the performance of the business on a forward basis in the future, discounting the future. And so, understanding that future is important. I feel a lot of when, when I work with uh, Chinese business people, when they evaluate future overseas investments, similarly to how they evaluate making investments in China, I think that there's not enough focus on how the world will change, how the market will change. I think you know people have already been paying the price for, for example, assuming that iron ore prices will always be high. Iron ore prices will not always be high. Uh, you know these uh, all these businesses go through cycles. So when you make a an investment at the peak, when, when you make an investment at the peak, uh, assuming that actually prices will always be high, you know that judgment that the returns on on the investment will be problematic. I think the second thing that people need to think about is actually, you know, when you make an investment in a different country, uh, you are relying on a different legal system, relying on different governance structure, relying on different enforcement mechanisms. So whether you actually, in the end, you know, I think when I make an investment, what can I do when things go wrong? And I don't think enough. Uh, focus has been given to this particular issue. And I think I would say that every time you make that investment, you need to think about that. Um, so, so I think that's, that's the second thing. I think the third thing that people need to think about is, is then to think about how do you manage the business. I think actually, you know, when, when I see a lot of investments in resources and commodities, in part it is actually a recognition that you know, we, a lot of our companies uh, actually lack the capacity to manage businesses. So the thought is, okay, if we're investing in resources on the ground, they can't run away. Right? You, 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 you invest in a manufacturing business, a service business, the business can disappear very easily. But when you invest in resources, at least they are safer. But again, you know, even if uh, there are resources on the ground, managing the extraction of that resources from under the ground, managing the proper transportation and, 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 and utilization of that resource is still a challenge that needs to be thought through very, very carefully. Many of those investments are managed by the state-owned enterprises. Is that the correct understanding? Yeah, I think yes. Are they in the best position to do so, Johnson? Well, I, I think, again, I, I, I you know, this is a, a complicated issue. Right? Some state-owned companies are actually have very good capabilities. Um, some do not. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's easy to generalize. But but I would say you know today, um, obviously you know China is faced with a unbalanced economy, and we're trying to figure out a way to balance the economy. And, and therefore, you know, when we think about making investments, obviously you know you need to balance investing in U.S. Treasuries that generates almost zero returns to investing in natural resources that may still generate pretty low returns but may be better than U.S. Treasury returns. So I think all of these things need to be considered. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Xiaomin mentioned that the uh, foreign policy. Uh, so, Papu, this is a question to you that we know that China seems to focus on the Pacific region, and this is a foreign policy uh, emphasis on relationship with the surrounding neighboring countries. Uh, in what way do you see Chinese foreign policy, especially with regard to the Asia-Pacific region, affects the economic relations between China and its neighboring countries? Okay. Yeah. Sure. And, and then you mean also the political implications? Yes. Yes. Well, I, you know, I, I think, again, China being such a huge uh, machine engine, a um, key driver that's contributing uh, about a third of the world's growth right now. Um, and therefore, the consumption is naturally very large. And it's not just uh, energy and resources, um, but it is also foods and food security. Um, and as they make these very, very large investments, um, I think, of course, there are concerns and countries sometimes are overly nationalistic, um, uh, sometimes for a good reason, sometimes not so. Um, and so, therefore, as you go to the United States, you, you have to be, um, defer the foreign investment um, review board, um, and every country has that uh, sort of thing. And therefore, uh, you know, it does raise some eyebrows when big, big transactions are being done, our countries Tends to, well, you know, first I think you need we need to understand the construct of countries and countries constitute people, um, and if it's food and you know you're acquiring let's say um, pork, um, like very recently Shanghai bought Spitfield, for example, it wasn't a, you know a, a, there was nothing there and it was done um, in, a, in a very straightforward fashion and um, no, no, nobody raised. And very much issues of national security they should be, but you have to understand that there are you know there are people that in these countries that are, are say farmers and so on that can be affected by these acquisitions, and the same same goes for acquisition of sugar in Australia and many other types of assets. And um, so so um, it's sometimes it's actually driven by certain constituents that actually lose out. And that's that's why that makes those countries become somewhat a little bit more nationalistic. Thank you, Jeremy. Any thoughts on this? Oh, uh, just quickly. I think uh, just one comment, very quick comment. I think people have been focusing on the the missing aircraft of F M H three seventy, and then China have made a huge effort to rescue, uh, uh, try to find okay, whatever wreckage or try to save life. What has exposed the the missing part is the China's lack of logistic support bases in that region. Think about all the ship with the aircraft. They have used Australia, they have used, they have a certain ship to refuel other ship. And we, at the same time, are in fact, prior to the, the aircraft missing, have been working on projects which I think hopefully will eventually, they will eventually provide some basis for Chinese vessels and other uh, transport, means of transport to have a logistic basis along Malacca and also I think Southeast Asia. That of course will require a lot of diplom diplomacy and goodwill uh, in those countries and of course has to work well with America which I think dominates that region. And I think uh, prior to the, 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 uh, the first question, uh, I'm a lawyer, so each time I go into a transaction, I ask myself this question, very simple question. If the party has the final say, people pay the party. If the lawyer has the final say, they pay the lawyer. So, for instance, there are a lot of big projects in China, oh, what have you. How many lawyers are involved? Very few, not me. Because for those projects, they don't pay me, I don't add value. Therefore, I don't force myself into the scene saying, look, hire me, I add no value. But when Chinese companies going abroad, 
I tend to add a little more value because their only protection at the end of the day is probably the piece of paper. Of course, there are diplomacy and there are other things, but they have to rely on this piece of paper more heavily than they do things here and back here. Thank you, Gabi. Um, so speaking of money coming in, uh, speaking of the uh, state of enterprises, uh, we have heard about, about the uh, potential, I guess, more SLE reform in China. In fact, uh, Zhang Chunxiao, uh, I guess, a SASAC advisor, was recently quoted in Reuters saying state owned enterprises will look to attract high caliber strategic investors, including foreign capital. Uh, Jan, let this question is to you. How does the, uh, what I think as a, uh, this type of uh, attracting high caliber strategic investors uh, mean to the PE investors? Is it a, in what way is it an opportunity and in what way is a challenge for PE investors? You know, I, I, I hope uh, it is an opportunity. Uh, I'm actually very much looking forward to seeing more, de more detailed uh, implementation plans. Uh, I hope we're viewed as uh, as high caliber strategic investors. So we, we I know we're not always viewed that way. Um, you you know we've seen actually a number of uh, uh, Chinese government entities actually placing restrictions on private equity investment. You know, CBRC places restrictions. CSRC, C, you know CIRC. A number of uh, regulatory bodies actually restrict uh, the percentage of ownership that foreign private equity uh, can can invest. Um, so I was hoping that actually you know they can relax these rules and allow more investments. I think uh, this is uh, to me a very obviously very interesting and exciting uh, prospect because the more the market is allowed to play. Uh, a, decide, a determinative role uh, in the Chinese economy, I believe, uh, the more uh, the economy, the, the overall economy will be on, uh, on solid footing. What would you say to the SLE or to the policy maker who put those restrictions about the value of removing those restrictions? What does PE investors such as Spain, what can they bring to, to justify the removal of those restrictions? Well, first of all, I think, uh, you know, again, you know, we are obviously uh, capital providers. Uh, so in terms of, you know, allocating resources, because again, you know, what does a capital market do, right? The capital market, the most fundamental uh, function of the capital markets is allocation of resources. So if you allow market sources, market forces to allocate resources, we believe that's actually a, a, a good and effective way uh, of, uh, of capital formation, of resource allocation. I think that's number one. Number two, in terms of specifically in terms of you know, private equity, I think private equity firms tend to be uh, involved in um, managing businesses, uh, involved in bringing best practices uh, into companies. Uh, I think uh, I talked about one of the most important things that we always do uh, at every company we invest in is to build a high performance organization. And hopefully, you have a high performance organization, you would actually have a more effective, more profitable organization over, or a business over, over the long term. I think the main issue I see is really an alignment with uh, working with SOEs, is really the alignment of interest uh, and the alignment of strategic objectives. Uh, because again, you know, when you have obviously a market based, for profit uh, investor alongside a government. Uh, that is not always motivated by profit maximization, right? The government I rightfully you know, have other objectives. You know? and so in, when you have these kind of situations, how do you ensure that people have a common objective and have a common strategy towards achieving those objectives? Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Chef, I think I, uh, we were talking a little bit last night and, and you said you like um, empirical evidence, you like data. Um, and I just happened to uh, very recently read in the research report, setting aside private equity for, for the moment, just looking at separations of our Chinese SOEs versus non-SOEs, the differential in return on equity is 900 basis points. It's 9%. It's something that is slightly sub 10% versus 18%. Um, and that's, that's nothing to do with drivers of private equity for the moment. But I think, generally speaking, uh, you know, when 
government typically owned businesses, there is a risk of an issue of absentee landlord. There isn't a real sense of ownership. Um, of course, there are, you know, another view completely, which is commanding heights, which is you know, something that's very nationalistic view, which is government should own businesses, so I'm not quite sure that's in a sufficient way. Kevin, <clears throat> from the lawyer's point of view, private ownership promotes the rule of law. I'll give you two examples. The lawyer's profession grew, there are two periods of time in this country where the legal profession grew by leaps and bounds. The first time was 35 years ago when the country decided to open up to the foreign investors. So all of a sudden, FIE, you know, the foreign investors that came in to form joint ventures, to do this and that. Guess what? The only document they could rely on, the only protection they could have was a piece of document. Lawyers' profession, the legal profession grew. The second was really at the, at the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, when the country decided to have all the SOEs to be, become public. That was another privatization. All of a sudden, they were linked to the capital market, they were linked to foreign investors in a more direct way. Oh, they came back to lawyers. Look at the past 10 years. Everything gradually becoming more and more stable. Lawyers had no role. When the stable company had a problem with another stable, they go to the party to solve the problem. They don't come to me to solve the problem anymore. Well, I could still give them reasons to argue in front of the party, but at the end of the day, I'm not making a decision for them. The party is making a decision for them. So I think that also, I think at the end of the day, damages the, con the country's attempt to have rule of law in the entire country. So I think there has to be a huge private ownership in the entire economy before the rule of law can actually have any rules in this country to grow. Thank you. So we talked about uh, SOE, how PE can bring capital to SOE. We talked about the inefficiency of SOE relative to non-SOEs. We talked about SOEs by definition is part controlled by the government and the party. Uh, this relates to actually another big set of SOEs, which are the SOE banks, the big fours and what the big fives. Um, and there has been discussions about the upcoming banking sector reform. So I want to hear your thoughts on what do you think the biggest structural impediment of the current banking sector is? And what do you expect to see the most promising or sort of how would you advise what type of reform would work the best for the current Chinese banking sector? Jensen? Yeah, I had the opportunity uh, to participate in the recapitalization of Chinese banks uh, in the early to mid 2000s. And so, you know, when I was a, a banker, I worked with, uh, actually worked a lot with CCB. Uh, in the end, you know, we successfully took CCB public. Uh, and CCB was, a large, was the first of the large four state of banks to become publicly listed. And I, I would say, you know, that recapitalization has been very successful. Um, so today, and that recapitalization really allowed the Chinese banking system to remain pretty strong throughout the, the global financial crisis. I would say, you know, during the global financial crisis, you know, the, the, the strongest major financial uh, system in the world was actually the Chinese financial system. Who would have expected that? You know, in the you know early 2000s, at that time, a lot of people were talking about the the overall banking system being insolvent. If we think about the banking system, the banking system still plays a very important role in, in capital allocation. And uh, today, um, a lot of that is still, I think, over-regulated. Um, you know, interest deposit rates are regulated still. Um, I think uh, lending rates are still largely uh, regulated. But then the regulation go beyond just simple regulation of deposit rates and, and then lending rates. I think the government plays a big role in terms of how receives capital, period. <laughs> and, and I think when you talk about a market-based economy without uh, 
market-based uh, capital. So I think in order for us to really have a market-based economy, you need to have uh, a lot further reform and restructuring uh, of the banking sector. I think some, some of the, some, you know, again, people talk about internet banking. Uh, that is actually uh, already, you know, I think that it's, uh, it's sort of the market of trying to uh, take advantage of the, you know, uh, the existing opportunities and go you know, ahead of uh, banking sector reforms. I, I'm hopeful that actually you know, we'll see real banking sector reform uh, uh, coming forward and that that will really, I think, fundamentally transform the Chinese economy. I, I, I don't think the biggest risk in the banking sector is necessarily regulations. I think um, the biggest probably single risk is a catalytic risk, um, black swan type of risk. It's actually uh, liquidity itself. Um, and that's, that's something that's pretty global. Uh, and you, starting off with the United States being a very big economy, for example, we only have to look in the past 10 years, our uh, M1 capital stock has, in, has doubled. It is today something like $2.9 trillion, whereas 10 years ago it was about 1.3. Um, uh, and to look at monetary velocity, if you look at M2, it is about 4x of that in the United States alone. Now, because money is pretty global, it's flowing everywhere, um, it's affecting exchange rates, it's affecting, therefore, the um, trades of various countries. And since the global financial crisis, everybody's tried to prop up their economies, and they've been pumping more and more liquidity in each market. In Asia alone, in the past five years or four years, um, liquidity has increased 55%. So now we're at a point where a, a lot of the banks are fully levered. Um, uh, and you see the low to deposit ratios. Many of the, the average Asian banks have gone up to uh, 90 plus percent. Uh, in some countries, slightly over 100%. So this leverage is actually in the, you know, firstly, you, you, you hit full capacity somewhere. Um, and therefore, there's less of a tool going forward to manage your economy with monetary tools. Um, so, therefore, I don't think it's necessarily related to regulations or falling Basel III. I think those are important things. Um, but I think the biggest single black swan risk is actually liquidity itself. There's just too much of it um, in the market, and it's harder and harder to manage. We have, we got the signal, we have about four minutes left. So, a last question, somewhat open ended. Uh, I want to ask each of you to use, say, less than 90 seconds to summarize, in your view, what is the next big challenge for the Chinese economy? Uh, Xiaomi? I think the economy, I mean, the, the biggest challenge is the political reform. I mean, that's the straight jacket of the country's. Uh, uh, economic vote. But I think, you know, for, for all political reforms, what is needed is a crisis. Because without crisis, there is no consensus. Think about uh, in 1978, the party said, look, after 10 years of corporate revolution, the country's economy was on the verge of collapse. In fact, that's a euphemism. In fact, the economy had collapsed. So all of a sudden there was consensus nationwide to open up, to do whatever was necessary to fix the economy and also to fix the political system. So it's a good thing to have, we don't have a crisis, but it also is a bad thing. Without crisis, we cannot fix the system because we cannot have consensus. Think about the environment. Not that you two, a few years ago, a lot of people say this is not smog, this is fog. Today, even real fog people call that smog. So there is a nationwide consensus to clean up the air. But we need a kind of crisis to have consensus for the political reform, to really inform, reform the economy. Thank you, Xiaomi. I, I, I think it's going to come back to our, our capital allocation um, as China shifts our more towards consumption-led economy as opposed to manufacturing-led. 
uh, sometimes capital do flow into unproductive areas uh, because people uh, don't necessarily just go into consuming things like um, whatever the government is trying to direct to towards. Sometimes it goes into real estate, and too much of it goes into real estate, and so on. And that, that's that's very hard to take a very sort of acupuncturist view to try to direct capital into very specific areas um, because it's it's coming from behaviors of uh, of consumers in general. Uh, but I think they, you know, the, the key thing, of course, is that it's going to be that and labor productivity and standardization. Thank you, Canada. I, I think uh, the biggest challenge is really finding a new economic development model because I, I think uh, you know the current economic development model was really adopted in the 1980s um, when you know it was decided that actually you know, China should follow the East Asian development model uh, to focus on manufacturing, focus on exports. So you have high savings rates. High savings translates into heavy investments. Investments tra translates into a lot of capacity, and then you need an export market to absorb that capacity. All of that is changing. Um, so how do you? What is the next economic development model? I think uh, you know that is uh, that is the biggest challenge uh, that we face today. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we'll get the, uh, the I guess the microphone to the audience. But before that, let's have a round of applause to thank our panelists for their. News and uh, actually, I have two questions for uh, uh, Sao Ming and uh, Zhu Jia. And the, qu the first question is Mr. Zhu Jia said that uh, probably the globalization has gone as far as it could. But uh, several days before, I got the chance to talk with some think tanks from the US. Actually, they are going back to, they, they are trying to persuade China to join them to go back to WTO system instead of just. Uh, um, uh, applying for the PPT, uh, the TTP system. Um, so in that uh, uh, kind of evidence that probably U.S. want to go to globalization, re another round of uh, globalization because of U.S. is going through kind of re, um, uh, how to say, re-industrialization. Yeah, this is the first question. The second one is that probably China is opening the um, more and more in the bond market or, or more generally it's like the capital market. So uh, have you, um, I don't know whether you have seen the information that probably the central bank will just uh, relax on the conditions from the uh, outside uh, outside uh, investors like the central banks or other uh, international institutions when they invest in the Chinese bond market. Do you say that probably these countries or these institutions really invest in this bond, bond market and what are the risks for them? And actually, uh, when I was in Singapore, I talked uh, uh, talk with some uh, investors. They are not very confident in the Chinese capital market, especially the RMB, and also the political system. Thank you. It's kind of a long question. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe maybe I'll talk about the globalization <coughs> issue. Maybe so we can talk about the other question. Uh, I, I think, uh, obviously, again, when I, when I say globalization has gone as far as it could, uh, again, yeah, I'm making a very broad uh, statement. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, going forward, clearly, you know, global uh, flows of capital, global flows of goods and services will still have a, a very important role. Um, uh, what I'm saying is actually you know, the percentage of global flows uh, will probably decrease, and the percentage of regional flows will probably increase. Again, so so that is uh, that, but that is not to say that global flows will cease. Global flows will not cease, and again, I think global flows will continue to be very important. Uh, I think first, and the second part of the question to me is is also very interesting. Um, I, I think obviously, you know, we've been operating under uh, a a global trade framework for some time. I think that global trade fra framework has a lot of gaps. Um, I don't think there is a good framework for global capital flow, for example. You know, WTO doesn't really uh, address that issue. So how do you think about, again, you know, the, the global financial crisis tells us actually it's very important to have a global framework that would help us, not, you know, help us regulate and safeguard global capital flows. I think we can talk about this issue 
as well. So how can we figure out a, a framework to uh, to to make sure that that, is, that flow is efficient and, and, and safe? Uh, I think the the thing to me that that, that China needs really needs to do is really to participate in many many more uh, multi multilateral bilateral uh, discussions on global trade. I think uh, previously China has been playing by existing rules. I think overall, you know, I think with the emergence of China uh, has actually made some of the existing rules probably obsolete. Uh, and then how does China play a uh, constructive role in formulating new global, new rules on global uh, capital flows? Global flows of goods and services, uh, both you know, on a, on a global basis and maybe on a regional basis. I think it's very, very important. You know, we talked about the fact that actually, you know, a lot of the things that we've done is risky. It's risky because, uh, in many ways, again, when you think about uh, having a contract within a sovereign country, you know, you know that there is a legal system. You know, there is a governance structure. You know, there is an enforcement mechanism. But when you do things on a global basis, a lot of these things become questionable. So how do you make sure that actually all of these things are there um, to, um, you know, to, to, to protect uh, investments? I think that previously we probably don't care as much about protecting Chinese investments uh, overseas because again, for many years, China was, a, uh, was, was not a, uh, an exporter of capital. Uh, but now China is, and China is one of the world's most significant exporters of capital. So how do we protect your know, investment in content coordination? So I would say, you know, I would really think that China has a big need to participate in global, uh, bilateral, and multilateral uh, discussions. Yes. Uh, I, I, I did not attend your Singapore conference, but I can share their frustrations and their concerns. Here's the reason why. For any bond market or capital market to grow, it needs the following. First and foremost, freedom. Money chases return. And it only can chase return if money is free. So it has to be it has to be free for the money to come in and come out and go out. People have to be free to come in and come out. We also tell, do we have that kind of freedom? Number one. Number two. You have to have transparency because money flows based on information, true information, not insider trading type of information. And three, this is you know for, again from a lawyer's point of view, it has to have a pre some kind of predictability within the rule of law. When I ask my client, okay, why are you make an investment today? If you don't know whether or not what you do today will be a crime tomorrow. You have to know what you do today is going to be good tomorrow. That's what I call predictability, but that has to be ensured by the rule of law. If we don't have all three, or if we have defects in any one of those three, it will be a long time for us to have a very healthy capital market. Thank you, Jonathan and Xiaoming. Do we have time for one more question? Okay, it will take one last question. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jen, and I'm the uh, field park value 809. I have a question for uh, Mr. Peckham. Um, yeah, so you have mentioned that um, liquidity has become a global issue, and also the capital efficiency uh, might be uh, the, the, the most challenging for uh, China economy. So with the background, um, in your mind, uh, what is the, uh, currently, uh, what is the, uh, the most capital efficiency uh, sector or industry in China? If you have the power to allocate capital, uh, what of the industry or sectors uh, you'll make investment? Um, my second question is, uh, we, we, we all, I think you all mentioned there's unbalanced economic development between uh, stay-owned companies uh, and uh, private sectors. Uh, generally, stay-owned company has the most power, has the most resources. Um, so with the background uh, and consider the capital efficiency, um, if you invest your personal money, what industry or sectors you will, you will make investment? Thank you. 
Well, I, you, you know, if you look, if you look at um, uh, China's GDP growth, it's, it's one of the highest in the world, um, you know, from, from a very large economy perspective. Um, so 7.5% is, is not a small number in a big economy. So I think if that 7.5% should become 7% or it is that people are arguing over right now, there's still a lot of juice left in that. Um, from a consumption perspective, because of the the demographics that China has today, with the GDP per capita that China has today, that is favorable towards consumption. So I think that the sector um, would would very much so benefit from that and still generates very high returns. Um, that was your first question, Liz. Uh, and your, your second question was related to SLE, and uh, I'm sorry, did you, you said that it's. Um, I think it's uh, that which sector would you personally invest your money in? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, if, uh, which, which sector? I, 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 you know, I still, you know, the short answer is it's still in consumption. Um, I think the you know the issue that I saw right in, in terms of earlier right SOE is that I, I think that I'm not quite certain on the numbers, but if you look at it from the uh, the, the Hang Seng um, uh, China shares in, in index, um, almost half um, of that is still SOE weighted. Uh, so that's a that's a significant number, uh, and you were asking about the, the differentials in returns, and that differentials was about. 900 basis point or 9 percent of the last I looked, um, and that's done on a, on a simple average, not a weighted average. So in terms of there are certain companies that may make uh, an ROE of 33 percent, but that might be a smaller cap company, and another big cap company might be 80 percent. 80%, so we, that's not done on a weighted basis. But overall, I think the demonstration there is to see that um, in the private sector. Uh, there tends to be more freedom to to chase returns um, without the concern of being of, of, of uh, government ownership. Um, that uh, sometimes uh, you are tied down to the fact that it has to cater to certain policy that may benefit um, you know the overall country, but not necessarily the shareholders. Okay. Very If I had a lot of money to invest. You know, my question, my question to myself is very simple. There are only three ways to make money. Number one, you work hard. Number three, you have new technology. Number three, you don't work hard, you don't have new technology, but you have monopoly. Well, sure. I mean, you have monopoly. You happen to be in a sector that everyone has to buy from you. You make an investment there. Provided the monopoly allows you to invest. Because very often the monopoly doesn't want you money. Because they want to keep the monopoly. I think this is what the China is not facing. Uh, thank you. I think that concludes our panel discussion. Let's thank our panelists for their insight and thank you for participating.